Victory in the Sea Lanes, the U.S. Merchant Marine in World War II. More than 16 million Americans were in the armed forces during World War II. A quarter of one million men served in the American Merchant Marine. On the massive scale of the war, one out of 64 may not seem significant, but we who served in the Merchant Marine were the crews of the Liberty ships and tankers that played a crucial role in winning the war. We participated in one chapter in the long history of American merchant shipping. Ships were vital to our country even before we became a nation. They brought the settlers, who became colonists and eventually Americans. The Mayflower that carried the pilgrims was a merchant ship. The colonies were built around seaports. Merchant ships united the colonies and established the links between the New World and the Old. The west coast of America was discovered and explored by merchant ships. On June 12, 1775, an American merchant ship captured a British warship off Machias, Maine. This is often cited as the event that led to the establishment of the United States Navy. The Merchant Marine was a crucial element in American coastal trade and international commerce. The War of 1812 was fought for the preservation of sailors' rights. American clipper ships traded in the Far East and American whalers ranged the oceans of the world. America played a key role as steamships replaced sailing vessels in the sea lanes. In World War I, American merchant ships were involved even before the country was at war. Merchant seamen died before U.S. troops engaged the enemy. American ships ran the U-boat gauntlet to supply Europe. They carried the American Expeditionary Force to European battlefields and back again after Armistice Day in 1918. During that war, the Merchant Marine was uniformed, trained, and regulated like the armed services. The losses of the Merchant Marine in 1918 war were many times those of the United States Navy. But when the war ended, Merchant Mariners were offered no recognition or benefits. Once again, as in all previous wars, the heroic contribution of Merchant Mariners was treated with indifference and disdain. In October 1939, just as the Second World War was getting underway in Europe, the steamer city of Flint became the first American war victim when it was captured by a German raider and taken to Russia. The crew and the ship were eventually recovered. A submarine sank the city of Flint in the Atlantic three years later. In November 1940, the United States freighter City of Rayville was sunk by a German mine. The engineer who drowned, Mac Bryan, was the first American merchant mariner to die in World War II. In the year that followed, before Pearl Harbor was attacked, America was technically neutral, but American ships continued to face the threat of belligerent warships and explosive mines. President Roosevelt proclaimed the freedom of the seas, but ships were defenseless in torpedo and gunfire attacks. Before December 7, 1941, 203 American mariners were killed, and 21 ships were attacked. After the U.S. was officially at war, another 9,000 American merchant seamen died, and more than 12,000 were wounded or taken prisoner. Overall, the merchant marines suffered the highest casualty rate of all the branches of service, it is estimated that one in 26 mariners were killed. Just before Pearl Harbor, Congress authorized the arming of merchant ships and the Navy trained gun crews for the ships. 145,000 men of the United States Navy Armed Guard served on over 6,236 American and Allied merchant ships during the war. Normally, about 30 armed guard members were assigned to a ship. Ships, crews, and the Navy armed guard formed teams to operate and defend the supply line that moved more than 7 million troops and vast quantities of war material across submarine-infested waters and under skies controlled by enemy aircraft. American ships carried essential supplies to Britain, 
While the Atlantic Ocean was a happy hunting ground for Nazi submarines, our vulnerability was brought home early in 1942 as the night skies off the East Coast from Florida to New England were lit by the flames of torpedo tankers. Hundreds of merchant seamen died and others were horribly burned as they abandoned sinking ships. During one six-month period, almost 400 Allied ships were sunk and an estimated 5,000 lives were lost. Many of our memories were not of disaster, but of the routine of risk and stress, of long days at sea and an endless round of responsibilities. Everyone aboard had a watch to stand and duties to perform. When the engine room gang climbed down to their posts, it was as if they were stepping into the crosshairs of a U-boat commander intent on killing them. Lookouts had to distinguish between drifting wreckage in the tip of a periscope or the churning wake of a torpedo. It was a nervous business, and the weather often added to the discomfort. Farm boys and men who grew up on city streets became accustomed to being tossed about in rough seas and learned the code of the sailor. One hand to work the ship and one hand to hold on for yourself. In 1940, the United States Maritime Commission embarked upon a shipbuilding program on a scale beyond all previous such efforts. In five years, more than 5,500 merchant vessels were built. New types of ships were introduced, including the slow but dependable Liberty ship and the faster Victory ship. On the average, three merchant ships were launched each day of the war. The shipyards were frantically busy places, often operating around the clock. Almost a million people were employed in shipbuilding. A new technique applied the lessons of mass production to the building of Liberty ships. Sections as large as 250 tons were fabricated off-site, lowered into position by specially built cranes, then welded into place. By this means, 18 shipyards produced 2,700 Liberties at the rate of three ships every two days. Faster and larger freighters and tankers were also produced in large numbers. It was a monumental achievement for American industry. The Liberty ship became the workhorse of the supply line between American industry and the war fronts. With a speed of about 11 knots, one ship could carry 9,000 tons of cargo in its five holds. This equals 300 freight car loads. The cargo could be 440 light tanks or more than 2,800 jeeps. A standard tanker carrying enough gasoline on one voyage to supply 35,000 drivers for a full year. Additional cargo capacity was created by adding deck cargo of planes, vehicles, and containers. Every effort was made to maximize cargo capacity. In one month of 1944, Cargo carried to war zones on the decks of tankers equaled the capacity of 55 ships. The United States Navy considered taking over the operations of the Merchant Marine, but recognized that it was more effective to operate with non-naval crews. The merchant crew for a Liberty ship was between 40 and 50 men. This number does not seem very large, but when thousands of ships had to be manned, the challenge was formidable and the ships had to be manned with trained crews. The War Shipping Administration had difficulty in finding crews. The United States Maritime Service was created to recruit and train personnel for the ships. The Maritime Service operated several basic training stations, including those at Avalon on Catalina Island off the coast of California and one in St. Petersburg, Florida. The largest training station was at Cheapshead Bay in Brooklyn, with a capacity of 10,000 trainees. The trainees learned basic seamanship in an intensive course of study. They were taught aircraft identification and the operation of naval guns and anti-aircraft weapons. Merchant crews were routinely assigned to work with the Navy Armed Guard at the ship's gun stations. At the end of eight weeks, some were assigned to ships and others were offered a few weeks of specialized preparation in deck and engine depart skills. 
since for merchant ships, leaving an American harbor was entering a war zone and becoming vulnerable to enemy attack, the transition from swearing in to putting oneself in peril was much shorter than one would expect if one joined the Army. A hundred thousand seamen were trained at Sheepshead Bay Maritime Training Station, numbers sufficient to man two thousand merchant ships, but they were only trained to serve in the lowest rankings. The officers and the ranking crew members were trained at sea and in other maritime service facilities. Miles McMahon of Summit was sent to Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn and learned the skills of a lifeboatman on the cold waters of the bay. The most unsettling activity was learning how to swim in water covered with burning oil. When he shipped out, it was on the Liberty troop ship Samuel Griffin. In May 1944, the U.S. Maritime Service began to accept 16-year-olds for training. It was advertised as a way for young men to volunteer for a part in the winning of the war. The press release said, A career at sea has always been attractive to young men. The Merchant Marine is playing a vital part in winning the war. Without it, supplies, equipment, and troops could not be transported to our battlefronts. A photo of Sheepshead Bay Training Station just one month after the age was lowered is a portrayal of youthful enthusiasm. These boys were anxious to go to sea and help win the war. They were soon on duty at sea. The Merchant Marine was involved in every theater and campaign of the war. The Battle of the Atlantic extended after the official end of the war. American ships were the victims of floating mines well in 1946. In all, 50,000 Allied merchant seamen were lost in the Atlantic. Early on, wolf packs of U-boats exacted a terrible toll. Supply ships were sent to the bottom, taking with them food and goods that England desperately needed. American steamships and Navy destroyers were in the midst of this danger and a number were damaged or sunk. After convoys were established to protect the cargoes, the battle developed a unique character. Ships would assemble in the East Coast ports and move in tight formations under the protection of British, Canadian, and American Naval and Coast Guard escort vessels. Escorts became more effective with experience, but still ships were lost many because of inability to keep up with the main group. The convoys to North Russia, known as the Murmansk Run, were hazardous extensions of this battle. A majority of merchant ships sunk in the war were lost in the Atlantic. Members of the chapter have vivid memories of wartime convoys. The invasion of North Africa and the opening of the Mediterranean Sea involved a large number of merchant ships. The beachheads of Sicily, Salerno, Anzio, and southern France took a large toll on merchant ships. Mention this part of the world at a chapter meeting and you will get some interesting stories. Richard G. Estraukas of Connecticut remembers when his liberty ship, the William L. Marcy, delivered 750 Canadian troops to Juneau Beachhead in Normandy. His ship survived an air attack and returned to the beachhead six more times, shuttling English, Canadian, French, and Polish troops from England. On its seventh trip, the Marcy was torpedoed and abandoned. Even though he was in a war zone, he recalls that his pay stopped when the ship was lost. He was one of more than 30,000 merchant seamen on 700 merchant ships, most of them liberties essential to the establishment and maintenance of the Normandy landings on and after D-Day. A thousand merchant seamen volunteered to build the artificial harbors formed by scuttled ships that made it possible to deliver supplies to the troops ashore. We were there at this turning point of the war in Europe. The common practice in the Pacific was to send ships to the war zones without convoys. The expanse of the ocean was a protection since Japanese submarines and aircraft were concentrated in the areas where combat was in progress. Once in that area, however, convoys became necessary and merchant ships sailed in close company. Ships spent months shuttling between islands, bringing up supplies from large established supply bases. Often they carried troops as well as materials. Photos of landings usually show merchant ships from which the beaches were being supplied. 
merchant ships suffered greatly from kamikaze attacks. Many merchant mariners who began their service in the Atlantic spent the final days of the war in the Pacific as ships made transit from one side of the world to the other. When the war ended, the United States Merchant Marine had been a participant in every major invasion and operation. Merchant Marine casualties were proportionately higher than any other branch of the armed services. The United States Navy lost 700 ships of all types, but more than 1,500 American merchant ships were lost. There were interesting facets of our service that are not well known. At the start of each voyage, we signed on shipping articles. In effect, we volunteered for each voyage without any knowledge of where we would be going or how long we would be gone. When a voyage ended, we were paid off. Our pay stopped until we signed on for another voyage. Our pay scale has often been compared with that of the armed forces. Analysis shows that there is a close equivalence even when occasional war zone bonuses are included and when services offered to members of the armed forces are evaluated. Not only was every one of us a volunteer, we were volunteers especially for every trip that we made into the war zone, and we signed on when ships were the most dangerous places to be. The Merchant Ring continues to serve our country and we are active in promoting its role in commerce and defense.